I would like to introduce you to our speaker today, Kim Bailey. Kim Bailey has a master's in gerontology, has worked in the field of gerontology as a lecturer and aging expert, expert for 30 years. Uh, she's also the program education specialist uh, with Alzheimer's Orange County, where she's responsible for developing and presenting programs in education for families, professionals throughout the community. She has a long history of academic, corporate, and nonprofit experience. Thank you, Kim. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Jasmine, for that introduction and welcome everyone to the web webinar. We're very glad that you've joined us. Um, before I get underway, I want to do a shout out to one of our sponsors, Diane Mand Mandini of Caring Companions at Home is having a birthday today. So happy birthday to you, Diane, and thank you uh, for being a sponsor and, and we thank our other sponsors as well. So let's talk about the holidays. A um, couple things I want to cover today. I want to mainly talk about why the holidays are so difficult or they can be difficult for our folks that are living with dementia. And um, on the heels of that, I'll talk about some methods and some strategies to make things a little bit more comfortable for them. I'll talk a little bit about some appropriate holiday gifts for persons in various stages of Alzheimer's disease. And I'll also pay some attention to those individuals who are living in care communities and how families can work with staff to make um, the holidays pleasant for them. But before I do that, uh, I'll do an overview of the disease because we have quite a few new people online with us today. And so uh, this may be new information for them, but of course our, our uh, ongoing regulars and our longtime professionals, uh, this is gonna be a review for you. So first of all, in terms of terminology, uh, people in the community, when I go out and do talks, will often ask me, what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? So we regard dementia as an umbrella term that really describes a whole variety, a long list of, dis of diseases and conditions that develop when the nerve cells in the brain are no longer functioning properly or dying. And so this is not a normal this is not a part of the normal aging process, but rather a chronic condition that is slow and progressive. So it starts out in the beginning with very mild symptoms and then gradually, typically over a long period of time, it continues to worsen. So I could spend a lot of time here, but um, I just want to give you some highlights. So if we think of dementia as that umbrella term, and I've already said that underneath that umbrella, there are probably a hundred different types of dementia. I just wanted you to be able to see on the left-hand side, some of the most common types of dementia that we see, Alzheimer's disease, which is number one, uh, Lewy body dementia, FTD, uh, vascular dementia, alcohol-related dementia, um, you know, there's and there, Huntington's disease and there's um, AIDS-related dementia, the, the list goes on and on. And in fact, uh, sometimes folks end up having uh, a mixed dementia. They may have as many as two or three different types of dementia. But for practical purposes, we'll talk mainly about Alzheimer's disease today. But then on the other side of the chart here, there's a, a short list and it's uh, just a few of the, the top potentially reversible conditions that are seen in diagnostic clinics. And this too is a long list, but these are some of the top causes for what we could call a pseudo dementia. So, you know, we see a lot of seniors out there in the community who are, uh, dealing with depression and perhaps it's been unchecked and untreated for many years uh, and that may look like dementia as do metabolic program or pro uh, sorry <laughs> problems um, problems with med medications perhaps someone's on a new medication and it's interacting inappropriately um, with the other meds they're on 
infections is a top cause for dementia-like symptoms. You know, it could be something like a UTI, a, a urinary tract infection that has gone on, uh, again, unchecked and untreated. Um, brain tumors, um, sensory loss, uh, and I'll mention, I'll highlight, in fact, hearing loss. Uh, is kind of, a, there's a link between hearing loss and dementia. Um, sometimes people are withdrawn and they're not, you know, able to participate in conversations and that worsens over time. That can cause cognitive problems and as do nutritional deficiencies. So someone might have, oh my gosh, a, a, a shortage of potassium, um, you know, perhaps as I mentioned, that UTI has caused them to become dehydrated and then their electrolyte system goes down. You know, there's all kinds of things that could go wrong that can result in dementia-like symptoms. So the bottom line with this slide is for all of our professionals uh, online and also family members is to be aware of the great need for an accurate diagnosis. Um, and we don't always get that from our community physicians. Perhaps they just do a simple pen and paper test, or you know, maybe they do you know, a couple different tests, but what we really need people to do is go through a comprehensive workup for dementia so that all of the things and more that you see on the right side of the list here can be one by one ruled out. Um, I just thought of another one that's a big one for me is sleep apnea. Uh, we've had people who, you know, were afflicted by sleep apnea and they weren't wearing a CPAP and they end up, you know, having these pauses in their breathing while they're sleeping. And that causes that lack of blood flow and oxygen to the brain. And so we see cognitive thing uh, problems develop as a result. So. We really need to, um, you know, be advocates for a proper diagnosis. And if you have any questions about that, you can consult with our helpline and they can send you um, a handout that talks about all the tests and all the procedures that should be done to render a, an accurate, a fairly accurate diagnosis. The other piece is that um, it's not just about Alzheimer's disease. A lot of our community physicians don't know about these other common types of dementia. So we really want to pinpoint what's going on in the very beginning, early on if possible, so that we know how to, to handle these diseases. Okay, so let's move on and just talk a little bit more in depth about Alzheimer's disease. As I mentioned, it is the most common irreversible form of dementia. It's a disease of the brain that interferes with uh, memory, uh, initially short-term memory as opposed to long-term memory. The thinking processes, abstract thinking, um, judgment, and really the ability to take care of oneself and to make good choices. Uh, does the disease process goes on for, as I mentioned, sometimes many years, sometimes not but anywhere from three to 20 years. And I guess if I wanted to narrow that a little bit more, I might say something like eight to 12 years. So um, it says an average lifespan of eight years after diagnosis, but bear in mind that most people wait to get diagnosed. And in many cases, they've already been showing, you know, some symptoms for a long time. So again, it gets, it only goes in one direction. It becomes worse over time. And the symptoms can vary widely from individual to individual. From a physiological uh, point of view, the, the biological markers that uh, are present in Alzheimer's disease and are detectable upon autopsy are the amyloid plaques and the protein tangles. So both of these um, both of these are made up of proteins that are produced naturally in all of our brains, amyloid, and then for the tangles, it's tau, T-A-U. Uh, for some reason in Alzheimer's disease, not yet known clearly, there's a overproduction of these substances. And so the amyloid forms plaques in the brain. 
uh, around the nerve cells. And then inside the nerve cells, we see the growth of these neurofibrillary tangles. And so this damage starts in the hippocampal area, which is responsible for short-term memory loss, and then it begins to spread into all other areas of the brain. So something to keep in mind when you're working with people who uh, are caring for a family member, also of either way, whether you're a professional or a family caregiver, it's really important to realize that behaviors are no longer a choice. Um, and this simple little um, continuum kind of says it all because if you start over on the left side, that's confusion and they, that's where they live. They live in a state of confusion. So some days are better than others. Uh, it may just be mild confusion, but it's always there. And so if you think about it, if you lived in a state of confusion, you would feel very uncomfortable. And when we as humans feel uncomfortable, we tend to act out. Um, you know, so for us, we might just call it a meltdown. But for people living with this illness, as their confusion increases, so does their behavior. And you see this as kind of a cycle going on multiple times, maybe even in the same day. And the good news is, is that we recognize this as a, a, a means of communication. So when words fail, people will express some of these behaviors and it's their way of trying to communicate with you. And we have a whole workshop on this, uh, so I won't belabor the point, but I think it's really a, a good takeaway, especially for those of you who are new, just to recognize that that behavior is no longer a choice. Believe me, if they were able to control their behavior, they would not have this diagnosis. All right, so this leads into our topic of why the holidays can be difficult for people living with dementia. Uh, during the holidays, and actually this is true of all of us, uh, but in particular, persons with dementia you know, can become overwhelmed, overstimulated, more confused, anxious, and it's all due to the dementia-related changes in the brain. So remember, it's not their fault, um, behavior is no longer a choice, but we'll learn today, you know, why these things are happening and how we can mitigate that a bit to make them more at ease during this stressful time. So there's some triggers, um, you know, a lot of times during the holidays, there's too many things going on all at once. Uh, there's a chaos or commotion. There may be unusual uh, sounds, um, more noise, too many people or visitors, maybe all at the same time. It represents a big change in their daily routine. And if you know anything about individuals living with dementia, you know that they do better when they're in their own, they're on their own turf, in their own home, whether that's you know, the family home or a care community, they do better there with structure. So in come the holidays and, you know, everything's changing for them and that makes it very agitating. Uh, as well, many of our folks do suffer from sundown syndrome, which means they start to get more accelerated or agitated in the later part of the day and into the early evening. And, you know, days are longer, there's more activities, so maybe their agenda, the agenda that you have for them is more than they're able to handle. So look for things like changes environment, um, measuring the fatigue of the individual, um, maybe there's too much decorations and clutter representing more change, um, Confusion about the holidays. They may not realize it's that it's it's a, it's Christmas or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa or whatever it is that folks are celebrating. Um, maybe there's not the same meaning attached to that holiday, even though that was something that was always important to them in the past. 
And then, you know, there's the fear of not being able to recognize people. If you think about how a lot of times people fly in for the holidays, they may be uncles or aunts or cousins or folks that they aren't used to seeing on a day-to-day -day basis, and that may trigger some confusion. So all of these are reasons, and you know, we could build a list with 50, 50 to 100 things on it, all are triggers for why we see our folks with dementia um, having a difficult time, and we certainly don't want that. More reasons why the holidays are difficult. Um, there may be problems with following conversations, especially if there's multiple conversations going on at once, uh, that they may be repeating themselves a lot. Um, they may not be recognizing friends and family mem members, as I mentioned before. And if you put yourself in their shoes, just think about just how painful that is and, and how, um, you know, how troublesome that would be at a family dinner when they're looking at faces and they look familiar, but they can't put the name to the face. Uh, so they may, in fact, confuse one person with another, call them by the wrong name. For later stage folks, they may mistake decorations or packages for some type of food item, perhaps. Uh, and they have not been able to hang on to some of the personal holiday traditions that mean so much to families, sadly. So, you know, a really important thing to keep in mind is that we want to keep everyone's expectations in line with reality. So we're going to suggest that you have front load you know, some conversations with some of the folks that may be visiting, uh, so, or anyone that's coming over, so that you can express any concerns that you may have about the events, and more, and even more importantly, make sure that everyone really knows where the person that you're caring for is in the progression of the disease. Um, you know, things change sometimes from visits to visits, so, you know, to make the other people feel comfortable, you can kind of let them know what stage they're in and let them know if there's any special concerns that you have. It's just a way of preparing uh, visitors and, pre you know, preparing. And here I'm talking about maybe people are coming to visit with you or maybe you're going into someone's home to visit or attend a party. It's just smart to really have people aware of, you know, where that person is. Um, you can do like a Zoom uh, family conference is something that I'm understanding works quite well for these situations, or maybe just give them a phone call. But either way, you want to make sure you update them on the condition of the person with dementia. And just, you know, make it very open and ask them what questions they have. You know, a lot of times people really aren't sure how to act and you can be instrumental um, at putting them at their ease just by telling them a little bit, you know, about the person that you're caring for or persons. Don't push to do more than you can reasonably manage. So keep your own expectations in line with this situation. Um, a lot of times the, the frills that we put into place and the extra uh, things that we do are sort of wasted on the person with dementia, regrettably. So um, you don't have to win the, um, contest, the neighborhood contest for best lights. Um, keep those tasks you know, sort of minimized so that you're not exhausted um, and trying to do too much. There's, and then same is true with holiday traditions. There's really no reason to try and include all of them. And it's sort of hard to deprogram yourself if you're a big holiday person and you've always, you know, gone above and beyond for the holidays. Uh, try to sit and think about it and maybe come up with some new, much easier versions instead. Because you want to be able to include the person with dementia. And so things have to be less complex and less time consuming. The rule is to keep it simple 
uh, simplify your holiday plans, streamline tasks. You're going to end up reducing your stress and their stress. Think small instead of big when it comes to activities. Make a list, set, priori uh, set your priorities, and take time to kind of play with this whole retuning of your expectations. And so important, give yourself permission not to be perfect. Uh, you don't have to create the perfect holiday event. In fact, it's, it's more realistic to expect things to go wrong and to take them in your stride. And the more you simplify, the less that you have to deal with and the less times things will go wrong is our hope. <laughs> Ask for help from others. You can think about different tasks and maybe ask other people to take those tasks on. Be gentle with yourself and others. Try not to should yourself. And I think we all know what that means. It's like, oh, I should have done it this way or I should have done more or I should have known this would happen. You know, let's not go there. Uh, do identify the people who can in fact provide you with support and again be specific um, when people say let me know what I can do to help ask them if they can um, pick up the pies from Vons or whatever it is that you need done give people a specific way to help and you know a lot of times they're really happy that you've included them in that way um, okay, so let's talk about some strategies or some things you might do. Uh, most of us want to serve a big um, dinner with all the traditional foods, whatever your culture uh, calls for, or whatever your tradition is. And a lot of times that's at dinner time. So keep in mind that dinner is sundowner time for many of our individuals who are living with dementia. So it might make sense to plan an earlier lunch. It should, it be, the menu would be simpler also. Or you could do a brunch instead of that elaborate uh, evening meal that you're used to, to doing. Yeah, that you know, by the end of the day, people living with dementia are tired and that's part of the reason, the fatigue is part of the reason they start sundowning. So let's switch it up and maybe make that holiday meal happen at noon instead of 6 p.m. And you might consider having it be a potluck or, you know, ordering in from Gelson's or, you know, Whole Foods or where, wherever you can find a, the pre-cooked dishes. So um, that instead of starting in the kitchen first thing in the morning and trying to prepare everything from scratch. So I love the idea of a potluck. Um, everybody gets involved and it makes things so much easier for you as the host or hostess. So um, you can focus on past holiday memories as I mentioned when I was talking about dementia, it's the short-term memory that's greatly affected in this illness, particularly you know, in the earlier stages, in the moderate stages, but they still can hang on to long-term memory. So maybe you've got a photo album or a scrapbook, or you can reminisce and tell stories of Christmas past. Um, that, that's very pleasant to do during and after the meal. You just have to be careful not to quiz the person with dementia. So, you know, kind of trying to force them to remember something that they can't remember is um, actually not a kindness. And so you can carry the ball on the conversation and you can tell from your loved one's expression if they are enjoying it. Uh, if you are a person who celebrates Christmas, you might want to think about providing a special stocking. Uh, for the person with dementia, and maybe you can ask some of the guests uh, beforehand to write little notes or stick a little photo in there or a small gift. Um, yeah, or even just to write a memory and then you can read them together. So that's a, a wonderful idea uh, that can be very appropriate. Don't leave the person with dementia out. Uh, whenever possible, we want to draw our individuals into uh, right-sized 
is what I call them, right-sized holiday activities. And right-sized means they're designed not to fail. So manageable things, safe things. It could be meal preparation. Um, you know, we're side by side. You can fix some of the things. Um, maybe they can do some stirring or mixing. We can also have you do things like wrapping gifts. Uh, and again, you're not looking for perfection here. You're looking for a way to draw that person in and uh, bring them joy. So yeah, gift wrapping can be a lot of fun together. You can decorate together. Again, keep things simple. You know, watch out for breakable things. Watch out for wires or plugs that you can trip on, etc. cetera. Uh, what else? Oh, I've got setting the table here. That's perfect as well. Uh, just do things as a team according to the, your loved one's ability. And then, you know, you can incorporate some past holiday rituals uh, as you like, but also, again, plan on some right-sized activities such as watching a holiday movie together, um, singing carols, perhaps, uh, or uh, you can look through photos of past celebrations. So, you know, you kind of see a focus here on keeping that person engaged, but making sure you're giving them things that bring pleasure. We just want to make the most of this time and we want to make it as comfortable for you and for them. So let's try to keep the bustle <laughs> of the holiday low. Um, just kind of dial it back. And when you do that, you're going to avoid agitation and excess confusion. I promise. You can plan for fewer visitors and maybe not all at the same time. Maybe they come at different times and you want to plan the time of day when you know that person with dementia is at their best. So quieter, shorter visits less hustle, less bustle. Uh, try to keep the routine of the person you're caring for the same as much as is possible. Watch for signs of agitation or frustration and be prepared to, you know, stop the activity that you're doing or just maybe say, let's take a, let's take a nice walk together. Or let's sit in this room, you know, which you know to be a smaller, less uh, crowded room that's quieter. Again, keep those decorations subtle. subtle. Uh, avoid a lot of clutter, which can increase a person's confusion and also increase their fall risk. Bright blinking lights that go on and off, like on the tree, are probably not the best idea. Uh, maybe just uh, white lights are nice that are stationary. You just want to keep assessing your environment to make sure that it's calm and pleasant for the person living with dementia. In terms of your approach, because your approach is so important, you want to as we've taught you in past classes, really approach from the front, speak slowly and clearly, and make sure that you have good eye contact when you're talking to the person with dementia. You don't want to criticize or correct or argue with them. And, you know, sometimes we do this just, un you know, unconsciously. It's like, what do you mean you don't remember our turkey dinners? Or, I can't believe you forgot that we went to Hawaii last year. You know, those kinds of things we say in a kind of a knee-jerk way, but they can produce a lot of agitation and humiliation in a person who's living with dementia. So, you know, even if they're saying things that aren't true, um, you know, the professional term for that is confabulation, but it's really, you know, we kind of in our brain may think of it as lying. It's not lying. They're speaking their truth, and it is an altered reality when you live with Alzheimer's or another type of dementia. So instead of correcting them, we just go along with it. Um, 
it's it's simple. We go with the flow. Well, it's not simple. It's hard, but if we if we keep this top of mind, things will go better. You'll have better outcomes. If the person starts to get agitated, you can take that short walk that I suggested with them uh, to distract them, or you can sort of regroup and distract them with something they love to do. So, you know, I mean, I always tell family caregivers that to always have, you know, top of mind, like three go-to simple activities that they know that person loves that can kind of put them in their comfort zone. Uh, and so, you know, it might be looking at a small photo album or it might be uh, getting them a snack. You know, you know your person, so we're going to ask you to apply that person-centered approach to really make them feel comfortable and to distract them away from, you know, sort of that escalation that you're seeing. And if you're away, if you're at someone's home or, you know, and you see that start to happen, it, you know, know that it may be time to go. Yeah. I mean, there's limits to their ability to cope with unfamiliar environments. And when I say unfamiliar, it might be your best friend's house that they've been in a million times, but things are different now that they have dementia. So um, make sure that if they're on a regular sleep schedule and if they take regular naps, you know, make sure they do that. Don't let them sleep too long or they'll be up at night, you know, but you just want to keep that uh, pattern for them as simple and familiar as possible. Always remembering to schedule things earlier in the day to try to avoid that sundown syndrome that we've talked about. Okay, what about some gifts? So, you know, again, we want to use a person-centered approach. So we think about all the things they love and we want to keep it simple. So we determine what gifts to give based on what we know about that person. And it, you know, it varies depending on what stage they're in. So if they're early stage, you know, it may be some kind of technology. It says day planners here. I don't even know if anybody uses day planners anymore, but, um, you know, a, a tracker for their appointments. It could be medication holders, photo albums, um, a jitterbug cell phone that it, those are very popular for people with early dementia. Music is good. Music needs to be in all three of these uh, stages. Um, their music, the music that they love. So maybe they you give them earbuds or you give them an iPod that's loaded with their favorite music. They may like to paint and so art supplies could be a great gift idea. If they're moderate stage, um, maybe easily manage clothing. So here I'm talking about like pull on sweats, uh, hoodies, um, you know, comfortable clothes that don't have a lot of complex features like lots of buttons or zippers, etc. Gift cards to get their hair done or maybe get a manicure. Music again. Um, maybe instead of a, a gift, you go to one of your, their favorite places. What else? Bird feeder, photo books, nature, animal videos. Whatever you think is best for your loved one. And then if they are in the later stages of the illness, think about pet therapy, uh, could even be a stuffed animal, their favorite animal for women. They often enjoy a, a lifelike doll. Um, we've been experimenting at our day centers with, I forget what they're called. I think they're called Comfort Companion. You can Google it on Amazon, but they're realistic stuffed, uh, pets. <laughs> Maybe it's called comfort pet. And uh, they, like the cat, purrs and, you know, lifts their paw and, you know, bends her head down to get petted. And the dog is kind of the same and they're uncanny. They're so, they're just great. So that might be something wonderful for late stage. Again, with the music, soft, cuddly blankets or throws, um, 
comfortable pull on PJs, flowers, fragrant oils, or lotions for a massage. I mean, you can, all of these suggestions are kind of all over the map because everybody's different. So I hope this will be helpful for you uh, in terms of trying to decide what to get the person. Avoid things that are complex um, or things that they're no longer able to do in their dementia, okay? All right, so, you know, just a few thoughts about uh, what can you do when your loved one um, lives in a care community? Well, I think for me, the bottom line is that a holiday is still a holiday, whether it's celebrated in your home or at the care community, which is now their home. And I encourage you, if this is you, to get involved with whatever the staff is offering at the care community because they could use the help. <laughs> and they love it when families um, offer to help plan and um, activities, uh, do activities with the residents, maybe even just come and help decorate. You know, they a lot of times will have different parties that you can participate in. So, um, um, so I just wanna share a little bit more about the um, RCFE situation or assisted living situation. So here's a few tips of things that you can do. You can bring a, a favorite holiday food to share, or perhaps you've baked cookies and wanna bring them to share with all the residents and the staff. Um, you can sing carols or holiday songs, um, try to get the other folks there to join in. You may want to read a favorite holiday story our poem out loud. Perhaps there's something associated with your faith or your culture that you want to share with residents. That would be wonderful. Just keep in mind that you want to keep that visit short and simple <laughs> and that uh, folks who are living in, uh, in uh, RCFEs and, and assisted living care communities need to have limited number of visitors each time. So you don't want to show up with a whole, you know, with a whole big crowd of people, but it's better to limit those visitors. And do plan those visits for times of day that are best for the resident. You can also consider moving the holiday to the facility rather than bringing the loved one home. Uh, and this is a tough one for families. They sometimes assume that their person living in a care community uh, would enjoy the holiday more in their family home. It's not always the case, especially if the person is more impaired. Um, it it can, could be that now the facility is their home, the care community is their home, and that's where they want to, you know, that's where they feel the most safe. So think about, you know, making that switch if you need to. Consider doing something much less elaborate to uh, celebrate the holiday. Uh, again, it's time to maybe start a new tradition. And if you are planning on spending the whole day at the care community, you should realize that, and this is hard, but you should realize that you're really doing it for yourself. It's not um, always to the benefit of the person with the illness. They, their awareness of time span, et cetera, is altered now. And so it's perfectly fine for you to just do, you know, a two hour maximum visit. That's perfectly approach, uh, appropriate and much appreciated. So don't feel like you have to go and spend the whole day. Um, if you want to, you can, but it's you're doing that for yourself more than for the person. So I hope I put that as tactfully as possible. Okay, and keep in mind, please, that although the holiday will not be the same as it used to be, um, it's important that, you know, if you're acknowledging the loss, if you're recognizing the importance of the loved ones who are there, and if you're honoring those memories together, then you are, in fact, creating a safe emotional climate for this year and good times to come. So I hope you'll take some of these tips that we've talked about to heart. And uh, just remember that the important thing is that the holidays is just another opportunity to share time with your loved one. 
try to keep these celebrations simple for both you and the person with dementia. Here I'm summarizing. Focus on enjoying the time together. Uh, the person with dementia probably won't need or appreciate all the fancy details. Just be truly present with your person. Uh, the present is really all we have with a person with memory loss. The holidays are a busy time. Remember, you can only do so much. You must take care of yourself so that you're in the best shape to take care of others. So as the little uh, picture there, the graphic implies, self-care isn't selfish, it's necessary. And you, you should, in fact, treat yourselves to something enjoyable just for you, and at least for a time, let go of the stress. All right, and with that, I want to wish everyone here uh, best wishes for happy, comfortable, safe, and blessed holidays. All right, thank you. Thank you, Kim. That's a very wonderful, uh, valuable topic. Um, we want to remind everyone of the importance of being aware of implicit biases, you know, unconscious stereotyping as we care for others. A best practice is the person-centered approach where we review each person that we care for as an individual with unique needs and preferences and treat them with dignity and respect even when they are very different from ourselves. If we always listen carefully and respectfully so that we understand their perspectives, values, and preferences, we can build trust and provide the highest quality of care. Now, if you have any questions for Kim, uh, please be sure to type them into the chat box or the Q&A. We do have questions um, that we will be directing to the presenter. Let's see. If my person, oh, I'm sorry, oh, yes? You know, before we go to the questions, I just want to comment on what you just said about bias. Oh. Um, if for those folks that are working in residential care facilities and in other care settings, the holidays are a great time, every day is a great time to make sure that that person-centered approach always involves culturally appropriate activities and choices for, for, the, for the residents. So I just wanted to kind of underline that. And I know you all do that, but it always is good to, you know, sort of keep that top of mind and remind people. Thank you. And what's our first question? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Kim. Uh, no, that's a great point. Um, uh, also, just a reminder, if you're looking for your CE credits, you need to be online for the full 60 minutes. Um, but if you need to go, if you run past 1230, we have 10 minutes here, um, you can leave. Um, just be aware, again, that the um, survey will be emailed to you an hour after the presentation ends. Uh, but you need to be here for the full 60 minutes. Um, also want to, again, thank our sponsors, O'Connor Mortuary, Care Choices, Hospice and Palliative Services, and Caring Companions at Home for making this presentation possible. Um, also, uh, just also be aware that our next um, uh, webinar is going to be January 10th on becoming a resilient dementia care provider. Okay. Yeah, Let's that's great. That's gonna be Dr. Galindo, who is a favorite with our group. Um, and that date is Tuesday, January 10th. So be sure and mark your calendars. Okay. Great, let's go to questions. We've got quite a few coming in. Let's see. Um, if my person with dementia insists on shopping for the Christmas gifts, which is very difficult, how can I handle that? Yeah, well, I would break that down uh, into you know, maybe a couple different days. You don't want to try and go out and do that all at once. Um, and maybe go over the list with them together and see if there's ways to simplify. Um, but in fact, you know, shopping with the person is a way to involve them and it can be really good unless they have, you know, behavioral expressions that may occur out in public, I mean, I think it, it can be a good thing, but I would just try to simplify it as much as possible and not to overdo it because the person will become tired and so will you. So it could, we want to keep it from being a stressful situation. 
there was a suggestion. Uh, how about Amazon shopping? That yes, I love it. <laughs> that is a great <laughs> idea because they have a visual of the gift. They can pick it. Um, that gives them choice and autonomy without having to leave home and uh, go on a confusing car trip. Love it. Excellent. Um, how do you mitigate risk of someone pulling a Christmas tree down while attempting to grab ornaments? If that's what they do, then you don't have a Christmas tree. You know, anything that's a safety risk, you want to eliminate. So if you know that that person, or if you've witnessed the person pulling at the tree or placing themselves or others in danger by doing that, then this is the year that you don't have a Christmas tree. I know it sounds, you know, like, oh, I've always had a Christmas tree, but you just, your, your number one concern has always got to be safety and also comfort for that person. So that would be my advice is eliminate the tree. Have a, have what about, um, what about like, like smaller trees, maybe a miniature tree or something? Could be, yeah. Maybe yeah. a tabletop tree or yeah, something smaller. I mean, everything I've said today is really to try to downsize things and make them less elaborate more rather than more elaborate. So, you know, maybe you've done that huge, you know, tree every year with all the exquisite uh, and fragile ornaments. This is the year to change that. And if you don't want to take a drastic step like not having a tree, then you want to do as Jasmine suggested and have something smaller and much less ornate. Uh, There's also another suggestion about painting a, a Christmas tree uh, on a wall or, you know, things like that. So, yeah, that'd okay, be interesting. That's a good idea. Painting it right on the wall? Uh, probably, like, maybe some paper and then posting it. That's my guess. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess you could paint over it. That's fine. <laughs> yes. I, mean, I love the creativity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh, let's see. See, we had a question about um, the jitterbug cell phone. Can you explain how that works? Yeah, now I don't really know exactly how it works, but I invite you to Google it. Basically, it's um, you, you program it um, for important people in that person's life, you know, just like a the people that they need to be able to reach easily and I believe they have it has big buttons and on the button I believe there's a headshot of the person so I mean the whole um, technology is designed to uh, give clues to the person living with dementia and so I think people have been they've had some success with that there's a lot of evolving technology that I'm not aware of, but it's certainly an area to pursue and look into because, um, you know, people with dementia have difficulty with appliances. I mean, they just do. And from early on, they have trouble operating the microwave. Uh, the remote control can drive you absolutely crazy. I know when I was a caregiver for six years, um, you know, I had an issue with the person I cared for constantly deprogramming the remote somehow and then I'd have to call Cox cable and you know they'd have to set the whole thing up for me again and you know so I finally learned that I had to keep that remote out of sight <laughs> so that it uh, make things easier so appliances and and technology is difficult for people with mm -hmm. dementia okay uh, so when I asked if you could expand a little bit more on confabulation. Okay, sure. So, you know, the idea, really the premise is that people living with dementia are living in an altered reality. So they don't see things, hear things, experience things in the same way that we do. And so what we do, just without even you know, thinking is we're constantly trying to bring them back to our reality when what we need to do is to step into theirs. So, um, you know, some of you have heard this story before, but I was working with a man uh, in our one of our programs, our gang, one time, and he um, asked me, you know, where did you go to college? And I said, Cal State Fullerton. And he went, oh, and I went, okay, where, where did you go to college? And he said, Harvard. And I went, wow. 
tell me about Harvard. And we went, you know, on got involved in this conversation where he was just so pleased with himself. You know, he's kind of lording it over the girl that went to the the woman who went to the state university. He went to Ivy League and he was just really full of himself and just really enjoying the conversation. And right in the middle of it, his wife walked up behind me and whispered in my ear, he never went to college. And so this is a great example of how going with the flow and accepting his reality, that was his truth, not correcting him, just letting him enjoy that and have that moment. It's a great example of how we can maintain the dignity of people that we care for. Um, we have a thing in our society about always wanting to be right. You know, and so we're always correcting one another, you know, and I don't know, it just seems like there's information overload, but we don't want to correct people who are living with dementia because they believe in their reality. And so again, if I had to sum it up, I'd say step into their reality instead of trying to pull them back into yours. And when they confabulate, um, it's okay. We just go along with what they say. Now, another counterpart to that is that we can lie too. Okay, and I, I highly advise it. We won't call it lying, we'll call it therapeutic fibbing. And all of the professionals on the line here who have been with us and been in the field for a long time know how important this strategy is. Um, because sometimes, you know, we you know, we have to say different things to make that person feel comfortable or have them accept, you know, the situation. So when I was caring for my lady, you know, she was always really, she was cognitively pretty sharp during the day, but by the end of the day, she was worn out. And so um, at night she would ask for her husband and um, I'd say, oh, well, he's not here. He's on a business trip. And that was a really appropriate reply because he did in fact travel his whole life for business. So she accepted that, but then sometimes she'd say, well, let's call him. And then I'd have to say something like, oh, calling him is a great idea, but let's wait until morning because it's that there's a time difference or I'd say he's probably sleeping now. So sometimes we tell a little fib just to generate the outcome that we need to have with our folks. I mean, and that outcome is that they're happy and comfortable. So you don't have to be right. Uh, and they don't have to be right for everybody to have a good experience. Thank you. Uh, it looks like somebody else called it um, therapeutic redirection. Yes, redirecting is, um, is the cornerstone to managing behavioral expressions. So, you know, the first thing we want to do is validate whatever it is they're doing. We're not going to yell at them, stop that. We're just, you know, going to say, oh, I'm so sorry you're upset. Um, why don't we talk about it over lunch? You know, so you're going to do some type of redirection that gets them off whatever topic they're on. They can only handle one thought process at a time. So maybe they're obsessing about something. Instead of arguing with them, we want to say, I, I know that's true, um, but right now it's time to go for your walk. Hopefully that person can, you know, just sort of get off the topic they were on and go into that pleasurable activity. So redirecting and distracting people, those are essential tools. You know, we talk about all these things in our monthly um, care partner, workshops that we do online and some of them around in the community now and so I hope all of you get our education calendar if you don't you can call the helpline and request it because we talk about standard topics like caring conversations tips on communicating um, behavioral expressions and how to manage them daily care um, activities etc so i invite you if you're new to participate and you're a family caregiver i invite you to, to uh, tune into those what's okay. our next uh, question looks like a couple more here um one says i can't be with my mother for um my mother has dementia during the holidays you know she's i can't be with her so it's upsetting her 
Um, is there a way to help her understand that I just can't be there so she forgives me? If you were trying to think of a reason to tell her, then you're trying to, to apply logic to the situation and that won't work with a person with dementia. You, you keep your answers short and uh, to the point. So rather than saying, oh my gosh, you know, I'd love to come, but I've got this deadline at work and, you know, work has been so hard, you know, it, 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 it just doesn't compute. And so um, you just apologize and you say, I'm going to FaceTime you. I'm going to, I'm going to call you that day. And then you redirect. So it's just that formula that I, I'll repeat it again. You validate the person, you know, and then you, you know, redirect with something, a new topic or with something that, you know, they enjoy. Yeah. Okay. Oh, by the way, I just want to mention, I think it is our 60 minutes have passed. Yep. And, um, you know, when we're almost finished, but I don't know if we mentioned the evaluation. You know, you're going to get an evaluation when we end the webinar. And if you don't get that pop up, um, you will receive it in your email. And that has to be filled out within 24 hours. Right, Jasmine? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions from our attendees? Uh, one last one, it was regarding uh, the gentleman with a Harvard education or not yeah. education. Yeah. Um, so if, if he's got dementia, how is he able to know the importance of Har that Harvard, uh, Harvard education, excuse me, especially since he never went to the college? Who knows? I mean, for him, uh, I think that particular uh, client that I was working with, working with came from a pretty wealthy background and so maybe he had an awareness that was part of his long-term memory um, maybe his son went to Harvard I don't know and it doesn't matter you know what matters is that he you know it was a very dignified moment for him he felt very good about himself people with the disease often have poor self-esteem uh, lowered uh, self-esteem and so the point of the story you know, we don't know how he thought he went to Harvard, but we just accept it and let him live in that reality because it's a good outcome for him. And it made him feel good. So that's all that matters. Um, was there, uh, Kim, there was a, a workshop you were mentioning at the start of the webinar? Do you recall? At the start of the webinar? Uh -huh. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> do you, <laughs> Jasmine, do you remember hearing me say something about a workshop? No. I don't know. I mean, I know that all you have to do is go to our website, everybody, and you yep. can see all of the talks that we're doing, and you can always call our helpline. They are so uh, wonderful. Uh, all seasoned, compassionate professionals, many of them licensed, and uh, so any questions you have about that workshop or anything else you can direct to them. Okay. Yeah. Um, again, just, I guess the next webinar though is, you know, the, um, with Dr. Galindo, um, mm -hmm. being a resilient caregiver. Um, that's going to be great. Maybe, yeah. maybe that's the one that the person that's, was asking about. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And that's January 10th, Tuesday. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's see. Oh, the uh, behavior behavior workshop. Behavior? Yeah, um, I don't have the calendar right in front of me. If you again, if you call the helpline, they can give you the date for that. Yeah, the helpline. Um, do we have the helpline number? We do. Somewhere? It's right up there on the screen for everybody to see. And that's operational Monday through Friday during regular business hours. Perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, thanks, Kim. That was great. Beautiful. It was great to be with everyone, and I, I of course, wish you all um, peaceful holidays, and uh, thank you so much for supporting our webinar series. All right. Have a great day and a happy holidays.